indigo around all these children. Um, but in a, to describe indigo children, um, if you can think of characters like um, Albert Einstein, Joan of Arc, Jesus, um, Bart Simpson, what can you, what can you kind of what can you pick at and see as in common with these four characters? So one's fictional, the others are living, some are, one's a religious figure. So they're leaders, aren't they? Yeah. They're all leaders. They do their own thing. They all do their own thing. Yeah. What else? Rebellious. Rebellious. Yeah. Anything else? What was, uh, what was Joan of Arc known for? Hearing voices. Hearing voices, yeah. Okay, so these are some common characteristics of indigo children. Um, despite, despite appearing as rebellious, um, indigo children are actually here to um, pluck away at all the lies and the corruption that's going on in the world around them. So if you can think of the 1960s as a, um, as a really um, movement-driven time, where there was a lot of uprising in this, in terms of the social state of the planet. Um, there was an increase in like feminine, feminist movements. A lot of that was to break down the structures in place that didn't resonate with them. And part of, part of the reason why this is such an important characteristic in indigo children is that they just, they have an internal truth detector which gives them that ability to know when someone's lying to them. And so if something doesn't fit with what they truly hold to heart, or if something doesn't feel right, they're not afraid to speak out. They're not afraid to put their foot down and to um, try and break this down or to um, cut it down, if you will. Um, they are very intuitive and they are very, um, they are very spirit driven in the sense that um, because they're so intuitive, because they're um, really switched on in terms of whether it be clairvoyance or clairaudience, clairsentience or claircognizance, because they're so switched on, um, once they have an idea in their head, they're really just going to go for it. So if you would, if you would need to try and describe the nature of indigo children, they're very, very masculine in their approach to spiritual expression in the sense that um, whilst they're hearing all these things, they're not afraid to act upon it. And if you could think of an analogy of indigo children as people who've come to the earth who are trying to, who are trying to pull out all the weeds or to cut down, cut down the forest that's already grown. So if you can think of, you know, all the systems that we have in place, whether it be the school system or um, authority or governments or um, anything, anything else like that, they're here to they're here to understand what's what's actually going on, and they're here to what might look like turn it upside down. And for this reason. If you are parenting or teaching an indigo child, a parenting or teaching style where, where a response is, for example, you know, don't do that just because I said so, it's not going to work. So they're going to really need to be reasoned with. And that, that level of defiance might be um, interpreted the wrong way if, say, someone who's really stuck in their ways and it is... Um, is quite ignorant or against change, might pick it up the wrong way and they might see this as defiance or rebellious or um, you know, not interested in what's actually set in place. And it's quite interesting to note um, that with all these indigo children who had come in in the past, there had been an increase in, um, there had been an increase in things like anti what might have been seen as antisocial behaviour, 
um, which was probably a result of the low self-esteem that came from these children being given these different labels and such. Um, okay. So for other things um, concerning indigo children, um, as a parent or as a teacher, um, it would be really important and really significant to be able to nurture their creativity because they're very, um, they're very intuitively, um, very intuitively driven. And there had been an increase in the number of children with ADD and ADHD and ODD from about the 1960s onwards. And can anybody think of why this might be the case? I have a daughter who's ADD, but she's grown up now, but she still finds it difficult to mm -hmm. be attentive. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I've looked into it a lot, and they do, it is thought that they are on a different level. Mm -hmm. They totally learn a different. Yeah. She, she would always learn just from stuff just coming in that wasn't meant to, mm -hmm. <laughs> just from background stuff, you know, yeah. she would sort of know it. And you go, how do you know that? You know, yeah. so you they they seem to be on a different um, mm -hmm. yeah, level of learning. Mm -hmm. So if we think of ADD or ADHD as the acronym, what does it stand for? Attention Deficit Disorder. Um, there's a, a other one to okay. Yeah. So so something we can um, something we can do with the label of ADHD. How about we rewrite that? into attention dialed into a higher dimension. They're channeling this information. They know that they just know these things yeah. and yeah. they're getting this guidance without it really having um, a true logical explanation. Yeah. 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 And you know, whilst everything is so logic driven these days, um, indigo children are really outspoken in what they've got to yeah. share. <laughs> and um, so, it, so it kind of puts another light onto um, how you can approach this ADD or ADHD. Oh, well, as a young woman, yeah. I think I'm just astounded mm -hmm. with her level of knowledge and, and the way she speaks. She's so well spoken. She didn't finish school because she was just so, you know, she mm -hmm. just wouldn't go to school and all that yeah, sort of thing. They don't but fit in the structure no, or they don't fit in the system. That, you know, she, she's educated herself. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, yeah. So, and the, the ADD well. children, they seem to me anyway, like the books you read. That's been increasing since mm. the 60s. It's not something that just happened around. Mm, it's the 60s not something that just. Yeah, it seems yeah. to be getting more. So does that mean that there's actually more indigo children? Yeah. Well, if you think about um, from the 60s onwards, there seemed to be a lot more uprising around the planet. Mm. Um, so that correlates with the need for indigo children being able to turn over the new, turn over these old systems that are in place. And later on when we move on to crystal children, you'll see why, why they're coming in these waves. Because they've all got their, they've all got their purpose at that right timing. So all children with ADD are like all indigo? Um, I wouldn't say that all, all children with ADD are necessarily indigo children. As some, some might just be here to um, experience a human life for the first time. And so some might be, say, crystal children, or some might be rainbow children, as we'll see later on. And because indigo children have, um, can have a very fiery temper, because they're coming from a place where they know what's, they know what's wrong with everything, and they're really, really intent on making a difference and putting their foot down, um, as a parent or as a teacher, one thing Another thing we would recommend is that um, indigo children be taught to express their emotions and to have a, have a um, positive outlet for their anger so that it's not channeled into something like antisocial behaviour. Okay. Does anybody have any questions on indigo children? What so about autism or Asperger's mm -hmm. as well? Yep, and we they're go. very focused on, on one thing, and they, they, they yeah, mm -hmm. so would you say that they're probably um, as well, or one of the... 
we'll move on to them when we cover Crystal and Rainbow Children because there is a yes. there's a strong link between them all. And when we when we talk about Indigo Crystal and Rainbow Children, it's not so that we can put them all in boxes, but more so it's um, more so it's kind of like they're from a different school of thought, if you will. You know, they all they all have a consciousness um, that that is similar to our own. It's just that where they've come from to incarnate into this earth is like they've been to another school and they're here to share what they've learnt. And so indigo children what, what yep. can you do as a parent to if you have a child that's not fitting in? How I mean obviously you can you can see it or feel it or when you meet these uh, kids. But as a parent if you have a child that's not behaving mm -hmm. as is normal. But what could you do as a parent? As a parent I would recommend that um, that you work closely with the teacher and perhaps develop a, an individual behaviour plan or an individual education plan. But would the teachers be open to that? Um, I have met teachers who have been mm -hmm. open to it, like reading material and, you know, because they don't learn about this kind of no. stuff at uni, obviously. No. And a lot of... Um, a lot of things are usually coined under the diagnostic, the DSM manual, I forget what that stands for, but it's like a diagnostic um, manual of um, different like physical and mental conditions and so that, that's a very old and very traditional way of looking at it but um, I have met teachers and parents who've shared this kind of information and they've had positive results in the classroom. So education is a great mm -hmm. um, is a great way to build up that rapport with the teacher. But obviously that's something that goes very slow because, as you said, they just put in groups. That's what's wrong with you. That's wrong with you. Yeah. So they feel there's something wrong mm -hmm. instead mm -hmm. of they're actually here for a purpose. Yeah. That we don't. Yeah. Yeah. Tend to medicate them. Yeah. 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 A lot of it's because they got bored and then they just they're not settled within themselves and they just want to go out and do things and they can't focus and concentrate. Mm -hmm. And then that's why the foods also, they eat foods that they're sensitive to because they're sensitive psychically. They, they'll eat things and then they'll react to food colourings, like red and green cordials, food colourings. Mm -hmm. So things that slow it down, like the brain gets slowed down by them having fish oil, which is a natural anti-inflammatory. So that's why, because they say that their brain's lacking a chemical but it's not, it's because they're actually getting all this information coming through that no one can understand, that the, no science can't pigeonhole it. So mm. they've got this whole world open to them mm. and they just mm. don't have the cognitive ability to deal with it at the time. And that's why they go like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let them, so let them nurture their creativity. Yes, that's yeah. why they open yeah. when they're older they mm. turn to alcohol because mm. it's mm. the and it also feels like um, part of it, part of that turn to alcohol and drugs is to is to um, escape from the world okay. because they've you know they've been brought up in a world where um, they're just bombarded with all these outside things like chemicals, things they're sensitive to, people pointing fingers at them, labels, and usually um, in my experience with children who. Um, are told that they have things like ADD and ADHD. <coughs> You'll get the kids who say, oh, that's, be you know, they'll mock up and then they'll say, oh, but that's because I have ADHD or I don't have ADD. So I'll pull them aside and I'll say, no, you don't have this. Um, and I know you can do better than this and I'd appreciate it if you could try. Um, because I respect you and, I'm, and I hope that you respect me in the same way. And um, so just being able to remove um, that label from them is empowering for them because um, being being very sensitive these children can pick up on the thoughts and the feelings coming from other people and for that reason if you're say if there was an indigo or a crystal or a rainbow child amongst us and you know we were all to direct a certain thought to him or her they would obviously be able to pick up on that and react accordingly. And so that's that's indigo children, the very fiery, 
spiritual warrior or leaders. And coming up we have crystal children who are, who are very much more feminine in their nature in, their, in terms of expressing their energy. So whilst they're very intuitive and very um, open spiritually, they're a bit more reserved um, and tend to work more behind the scenes rather than getting out there. Um, so they're not really driven by the anger or um, they're not really intent on they're not really intent on drawing a lot of attention to themselves um, and part of the reason is because they're they're here to carry off or carry over or carry on from where the indigo children have been so whilst uh, we come back to that imagery of the indigo children cutting down the forest. The crystal children are here to plant the new seeds. So if you can think of this imagery of the garden, they want to be able to plant these seeds without being disturbed or without being interrupted or questioned. And because they have a very gentle approach to the way that they do things, it's more common for them to just try and work behind the scenes um, so that so they don't get they don't pick up too much from what's going on around them. Um, crystal children are have been coming here from about the year 2000 onwards. So if anyone has any children say under 14, you might notice it a bit more. And Similar to indigo children, they really need to really need to have their creativity and their intuition um, nurtured if they are to if they are to shine brightly. And they they are very sensitive to different foods and chemicals, like mentioned before. And as a teacher, I've noticed that there's a lot more. Um, there's a lot more different things that kids are allergic to. And, you know, when I was going to school, say 20 years ago, there weren't as many things that um, to look out for. We didn't have anaphylaxis. We didn't have, um, you know, allergies to eggs and um, certain sweets and things like that. And so that really, really makes us question or really makes us want to ask, you know, what's going, what's going into the foods these days that's um, creating these reactions from these people who are very sensitive. And lately there has been an increase in the number of cases of things like autism or late talkers, Asperger's. Can anybody think why? There might be this increase. It's one the combination of many things. Mm. Mm. Well, Di the diagnosis. Yeah. I mean, they did exist. They did. Yeah, mm. they did. It's exist. just simply mm. that yeah, like, you know, cancer diagnosed. wasn't diagnosed. Mm. 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 My brother was called incorrigible. He's bipolar, mm. and everyone in my family is. Mm. Has mm -hmm. been for the last two centuries. So there is inheritance factors. Mm. I have a yeah. forty-something year old brother who. Nobody knew what was wrong with him, and that now it's just so obvious. He's Asperger's, it's mm -hmm. so um, obvious, but it mm -hmm. wasn't diagnosed back then. No, you were called incorrigible or difficult. Yeah, he, he was, was just a lady. He was a medicator and all sorts mm -hmm. of things, just stupid, you know, things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's a big point, isn't it? That they have actually been around mm -hmm. for a long time. Yeah. Well, one thing with crystal children is that they are highly telepathic. So if you think about this link between um, the increase in children who are more telepathic and say an increase in greater numbers of people who are late talkers or children who are late talkers um, it's it's more like these children are showing that they communicate in different ways you know through emotions through their through their body language and through um, other means whether it be psychically or physically and so with crystal children um, being, able to, being able to understand their emotions and getting them to express them in healthy ways is something that's really beneficial for them. And does anybody here, oh, does anybody here have any children under 10? Under 5? I don't have any children under 10. 
Understand what she's saying. Because she understands yeah, everything, means. but she just says sounds wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, and I think she's got a, a grandchild like that too. Yeah. Understands everything. Yeah. yeah. But that's how it works. Yeah. They won't mm-hmm. speak all day. Yeah, but they bet if you say go over there, yeah, 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 that's yeah, 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 the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same thing. Mm-hmm. And is that, a coral, is that synonymous with crystal children? Yeah. It seems quite prevalent in the sense that the they tend to be more telepathic than verbal in their early mm. developmental mm. years. Yeah. Because you see them reading your mind as well. Mm. Yeah, and yeah. they, they yeah. read a lot yeah. with their eyes, yeah. like they're looking right into your soul. Yeah, yeah. And, then, yeah. 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 and another true. thing with crystal children is their eyes are really big and round. Yeah, yeah. Mm. big blue and big yeah. round. Yeah. So just, yeah. as you're watching them watching you, um, it might be a good opportunity for you just to try and be still, you know, wherever you are in your environment and get a sense of what you're feeling. Because you're, as they're looking into your eyes, it's like they're connecting with your energy, they're connecting with your soul. Um, might be more inclined just to talking to those who are really close to them. Um, so it really, it really depends on the child itself and the environment that they're brought up in. But can it develop into like speaking normally? Yes, it can. Yes, can. Of it just takes. Yeah, it just takes them a bit longer to yeah. get comfortable with speaking. <coughs> I don't think they see the need for it, do they? In the beginning, mm. Mm. oftentimes they don't particularly if they're a second or third child. Mm. Yes, it, it's just because yeah. like Lara and me, she has three older oh, siblings, and you think, how can she not say something? <laughs> it's because she doesn't yeah. have to, because they actually respond it's to her. It's just sounds. Just go. Uh, but she, yeah. Yeah. she knows everything. Uh, uh, and she feels not yeah. yeah. Mm. They're actually really quite they're, they're really quite clever because mm. they know that by not speaking mm. they, they can actually disappear in the background and get exactly what they want. Yeah. Because everyone yeah. else is, is you know, mm. doing around. But if I had a friend whose son did not speak a word, not even a sound, we'd simply go, mm. Point, do that. And at four, he suddenly decided that he was fed up with being silent and being spoken now he doesn't shut up. Mm. <laughs> but he came out just with full like almost Mackenzian language <laughs> and he'd obviously spent you know four years just sitting listening to adult vocabulary who was a second mm. child mm. and his vocabulary outstrips his older brothers by far mm. so he just you know they just it's almost like they're, he's being really really careful to everything that's going on but if they are crystal kids they will be different the whole life won't they like when I say different I don't mean it negative but won't they be a bit like, as you said, they are more it, quiet, they're more in the background. Um, it does go both ways. You might get yeah. you might get children who are a bit more um, extroverted, or you might get children who are a bit who are a bit introverted. But that doesn't go to say that um, that doesn't go to say that um, they'll be fully um, fully open in expressing their spiritual gifts. So while in whilst in an everyday situation they might be talkative, they might not be so off open to showing these kinds of abilities in their everyday lives. And um, just in my conversation before with Casey, is it? Yeah, um, we were just talking about how crystal children are quite clingy, or a bit um, sometimes a bit shy. And again, that comes with the sensitivity and just not being, at first they might not know who to trust. Um, you know, being being so open and receptive to the emotions and the energies of others, it's like they're being bombarded with all these things and they need to know, um, they need to be able to know who they can let into their energetic space. Do you think that they are drawn to people who... who have an energetic understanding of them. I feel that they are. Mm. Um, I notice that with Izzy quite often. Mm. She's drawn to certain people and she's just completely open with them. Whereas, mm. as you've described, she's very shy and reserved with other people. Mm-hmm. 
And Crystal children have only come about since. Um, I guess you could say they've always been around, but more of them have started to come through okay. from about 2000 onwards. Is that because we need them? We need well, they're here, they're here, they're yeah, we that need that purpose. energy, and mm -hmm. they're here to they're here to pick up where the indigo children are leaving off or leaving them leads. Mm -hmm. It's interesting just how many of you have had a good experience with this type of child in that mm. age group that you mentioned, all of a sudden everybody's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It is, so obviously it? quite prevalent. Yeah. Mm. I'm just, I just wonder how they would be affected because we're all worried, you know, because we think there's something wrong with that. Mm. So, so, so they will get the wrong sort of messages back that there's something wrong with me. Um, and, and I think that, yeah, I that see would be hard to from. live with. Yeah, I see where you're coming from with that. And the best thing that you can do as a parent or a teacher or a carer of children is be open and understanding to what kinds of things they're displaying or what kinds of things they're showing and being able to educate those around you or being able to um, find people who are like-minded or find um, like-minded teachers or parents or carers who you, can, um, who you can build like a support network with. Because um, you know you might have you might have a sensitive child like a niece or a nephew or a, a child of your own in your class, something like that. Um, but you might not be the only one in your community um, experiencing this sort of stuff. So if you connect with people who are going through similar things, you can share your experiences, and the children themselves will feel more empowered because they've got someone who they can relate to. Um, just for example, in like some of the children's workshops that we've done for children in um, connecting with their angels, um, you know, five different children all thought that there was something wrong with them, and they all came in feeling really anxious. But in the end, they were, you know, talking to each talking to each other, giving each other readings, and doing readings for the parents. Um, they were between six and eleven. <laughs> So if they can find people who they can relate to, whether it be child or parents, they'll feel more comfortable in nurturing that side of them. Mm -hmm. I did. That was the intention of it. And, um, we facilitate them as parents yeah. and children so uh -huh. that they can build a um, shared understanding. Mm -hmm. Because not, not all parents understand what's mm -hmm. going on, but mm -hmm. when they can see that other parents are in a similar situation, mm -hmm. um, you know, then they can let their guard down mm -hmm. a little bit, or then they can open the door up mm -hmm. um, to experiencing and to learning this sort of thing mm -hmm. and um, make a better informed choice about um, yes. how they parent their child. Was there a reason for that particular age group? Because um, there, there's the theory that children's formative years are up to the age of seven and experience and knowledge. That too. was just That's when you um, knock out your intuitive level a lot too mm -hmm. because you get the conditioning from parents yeah. and children and teachers. So at that six to age, that's kind that of was where just they could almost in. lose it or yeah. acknowledge it. And is that a specific age? No, I just opened it to everyone. Okay. I have. Because I have had people as young as five come to the workshops. So it just, it's just a matter of who comes and their age. So I don't have a set age for them. Okay, and we'll move on to rainbow children. These children could be described as, um, as like enlightened living avatars. They're a combination of the masculine and the feminine energy. So really outspoken in their spiritual gifts, but at the same time they're very sensitive and very aware of um, when to retreat. Um, rainbow children are the kinds of children who, um, coming back to this garden analogy, so after the, after the weeds have been pulled out and the forest has been cut down and the seeds have been planted, they're the ones here that are, that are watering the plants and feeding them and making sure they get enough sunlight. 
So part of their purpose here on this planet is to ensure that um, there's light in the world, there's love in the environments and the homes around them. And usually with rainbow children, um, their parents will either be indigo or crystal children. Um, there haven't been as many, there, haven't, there aren't as many on the planet yet, but when you do meet a rainbow child, you'll tell who they are by their almond-shaped eyes. And they commonly they haven't been to Earth yet, so this is usually their first incarnation on the planet. And they tend to be able to manifest things really rapidly, and so because of that, they need to be taught um, that here on Earth that they need to be patient because things don't happen straight away. Um, as they combine both the aspects of indigo and crystal children. They still carry that sensitivity to the foods and the chemicals. Um, they still develop, um, they still show those signs of high signs of telepathy, but they're not afraid to speak when they need to. And these are the kinds of children who are highly intelligent, who are the ones from such a young age are already know what's going on, already know what they want to do with themselves and are actively. Um, trying to make a difference. Um, for instance, with some of the rainbow children I've come across, um, yesterday I was talking to a mother whose son is 10, and he's already set up a website and is already making his own essences. Um, and then if you look around the world, you've got other children, say, in the 13 or 14, who are already developing like cancer cures and um, energy alternatives. So these are the kinds of children who um, carry the wisdom of, um, who carry such an in-depth wisdom of things like healing and um, science and technology, and they're able to just put it into practice. This information just comes from an unknown place, and they just know what to do with themselves and apply themselves. So. Um, Rainbow children might come across as children who are really outspoken and have a, have a lot of creativity and have a lot of ideas to share. And they're not afraid to share these ideas with other people and they're not afraid to give things a go. Um, rainbow children... Rainbow children can... Um, rainbow children tend to tend to express or display themselves um, in quite a broad spectrum and um, at first, at first you, um, when you come across the presence of a rainbow child um, you really just be able to feel the, the warmth that they radiate so they'll naturally be very drawn to energy healing so it might be a good idea to check out their hands if you come across rainbow children. And they also have a strong affinity to um, crystals, just like crystal children do. Um, are there children that don't fall into any of these categories? There are. Yeah. There are. And when we said before that these are, these are like schools of thought where they've come from, it's like at the end of at the end of the day, um, part of the purpose of all these children being here is so that they can remind us about all these qualities that are already inherent within us. And as rainbow children are the balance between feminine and masculine um, expressions of spiritual gifts, um, rainbow children empower us or remind us. Um, that deep within us there's a balance that already exists and it's about us being able to nurture what's within us and be able to um, share that outside of ourselves. Okay. How are we going for time, Fee? Yeah, about quarter past eight. Okay. And would you say the rainbow children are very confident? They're just they're so confident that they can do this and they just do it? They just they do, do it and they make it happen. They've got no fear of, well, maybe I can't do this, they just go. Yeah. 
that's pretty much it. And um, just coming back to this parent who I was talking with yesterday, um, her son has a clear recollection of um, when he was in the womb, and he has a clear recollection of where he was before being on Earth. So he's he sounds like he's a, very, a rainbow child. Yeah, he's a but, rainbow but child. But he has had a um, a previous life, right? has he? Not on Earth. Not, on, no. not on Earth. Mm. Okay. Mm. So and how old is he now? He's ten. Ten. Mm. Does anybody have any questions about rainbow children? Is there any particular sort of um, I guess like star group where they come from? Or is it? Um. At the moment, it seems like everyone's coming from all different star groups. You know, you've got your Syrians and your Palladians and your Arcturians who are incarnating into human bodies. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't say that they come from one particular um, star system, um, mainly for, due to the fact that every star system carries with it a different kind of, a different vibration or a different... Um, a different energetic gift that they want to impart with the world that they're coming into. Yeah. yeah. And you said that the, the rainbow children have an affinity with crystals, so um, are they sort of, do you think that they would come from that, that crystal and you know, be very drawn to the, the grids and the, the, you know, the portals and all that sort of stuff? Mm -hmm. You will get some children who, who will just, you know, walk into a crystal store and know what, exactly what to do with them. Or, um, you know, I've come across one of my friend's daughters who asked for this list of all these ingredients to, again, make essences with. And, you know, the, the dad hadn't even heard of half of these ingredients. And so they went shopping together and she, you know, she, was, she would have only been about eight at the time. So... You know, picking up something where you can barely read the label of the jar is... <laughs> but knowing um, what it does. But knowing what it does is <laughs> something to think about. <laughs> so just thinking about these kinds of children, um, a lot of the system, a lot of what's currently in place is based... You know, a lot of the parenting and the teaching styles at the moment is just based on what they've been brought up with. And so part of the reason why the indigos came was to turn that upside down. And again, when the crystal children came through, because they've got such a gentle and a, uh, a soft approach to things, um, part of what they were here to do was to was to encourage or to teach parents to um, come up with new ideas in a, in a more gentle way rather than feeling that they had to, that they feel like they had to try and stomp on everything mm. early. And so the rainbow children are the ones who, um, you might even find that rainbow children don't require much, um, they don't require much discipline for the fact that they're already quite aware of what they need to do and their own responsibilities. They pick on two because they are just, you say, very intelligent that they are different. Are they all, I mean, because not many knows about these things, so mm -hmm. they will all be sort of... Um, I think they'll be generally drawn to each other. Uh -huh. So rainbow children already have that awareness, and they'll be able to pick out each other. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you were in a class situation, would you see, like, kids being drawn to each other because they have... Um, you do. It is common to see them mingling for those reasons, but then it's also common for them to be mixing with the other kids who um, who need a bit more encouragement or enlightenment in other areas. If that makes sense. Casey, can you look at your class of little children and sort of see characteristics? I can. Oh yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. 
um, these children are all, are all coming, but nothing's really changing. But in terms of like the primary and secondary no, system, still, still, yeah, it's still a bit like an English boys club. Yeah. 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 So that's why we need lots of people like yeah. Nathan. Yeah. 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 And yeah. that's why we need parents and carers yeah. such as yeah. yourselves, yeah. so that you can try educate. To introduce and connect like-minded adults and children together. Well, that's what... Um, are you going to mention your thing at the oh, thing? Yes. There's, there's oh, a word I, I can't say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this Sunday um, at the Theosophical Society in Sydney, um, where Adia used to be, um, we'll be holding a, a day seminar on indigo crystal and rainbow children. Um, so it goes from about 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock mm -hmm. and it'll be a day of um, learning a bit more about these children, um, hearing some stories and experience from um, other parents and other children who are there mm -hmm. and a little bit of intuitive development for some of the children and the parents who are there so that they can try out these things with the children in their lives. Mm -hmm. And um, I've got a range of uh, guests who are guests who will be there, and as, as well as some virtual guests. So I've got people from teaching backgrounds, uh, naturopath backgrounds. Uh, I've got parents. I've got high school kids. Um, so it'll it'll try and cover a broad range of how people have been experiencing um, these children. Uh, whether it be in their own lives or through um, the lives of another. And this is the second one you've run now, is it? Or yeah, the first it time was a talk and right. on Sunday. It's mm -hmm. going to be a whole day thing. Mm -hmm. So, so I could ask you, are you a teacher at a, at a primary school? Or? Yeah, I am a primary yeah. school teacher. Is that something you would try to, because I would feel terrible if I had a child that was put a stand on as, you know, ADD or whatever, and then you realise many years later that obviously medication and everything is completely wrong, but I didn't know as a parent anything about it. But it isn't something that teachers really need to be. That's the next step, isn't it? So yeah, they that's what I'm struggling with too, like mm. the mainstream teaching and then yeah. our knowledge of this. Like how do you incorporate yeah. that? How do you approach parents that aren't necessarily open to this type of thing as well? Mm. Yeah. Yes. That would take a long time. Mm. Yes. Mm. Um, I think you'll find most parents who have a child who is the same age and ADHD or whatever label that's been put on them, they would be just searching and searching for that. So yeah, a lot of, a lot so. of, and the so children aren't diagnosed with ADHD. Yeah, mm. but still that, but still that, that, that sort of the, the displaying mm. those sort of behaviour yeah. 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 things that the parents are just going, I can't deal with this. So, that would be so if to some, if there were more so avenues yeah. around yeah. That, of talks like that and things like that, I'm sure that parents, if, if there were notices up in the school or the teacher gave them out, I don't think you know? I'd be allowed to do that. No. Mm. Mm. Um, so eventually, I do I want to. It needs to, it needs to come from the yeah. system. Mm. I've said yeah. a few little yeah. things like. Yeah, so, it's, yeah, it's a bit difficult because yeah. you don't difficult. you don't know where the line's drawn, yeah, and yeah. these are come these are some of some things that might get you sent out the door yeah, exactly. in a system yeah. you yeah. know where it's still quite yeah. pyramid like, yeah. and um, so the best thing to do would be yeah I guess to develop develop relationships with the parents and get your good get a good report with them. Um, like Casey's described in some of the instances with the parents she knows. Start and to refer as to workshops like this. Yeah, start to refer and um, giving them, you know, even presenting like little bits of reading material yes, or yes. Um, suggesting different things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even, even if you just start in a light and gentle way, so not, not instantly saying, oh, you know, your child's highly psychic or your child's highly <laughs> telepathic. Um, but just in another sense, you could yeah. just lightly introduce it, like saying something like, oh, do you think maybe it's not a medical condition? Do you think maybe there's something more to it than um, 
than tablets can fix? Or um, do you think it's something in the diet that might be affecting the way that he's shutting down? Or you know, just looking for alternatives as to how you approach the way that um, these subjects are brought along, I think can help um, help them gently integrate into what their current understanding of things is. And so eventually I do intend to, you know, present these kinds of things to teachers in schools and, you know, at universities and things. So I'm trying to put together a literature review so that I can um, approach this um, and, you know, address educational concerns and health concerns and psychological and um, health practices you know, all those different umbrellas um, in an academic way. There are so many of them. It must give you some credibility, you know, in getting this to where you've opened it to, that you've got some people and developed them. I have had a lot of um, positive response from the teachers and parents that I've worked with. That's good. That's really interesting. So where do you have the information from? Where do I get it? Yeah, where, where do you get, um, like, um, you, you know so much, uh, it's, it's interesting. It just comes. <laughs> <laughs> Channel. Channel. Yes. Which one of you again? Hmm? What was that say? Which one of you again um, when you were growing up? Um, for me, it feels like it's changed. So it feels it feels like I was indigo, but then, but then but then it sort of, then I I did show those signs of because um, I was a late talker and I was very reserved, but so I did feel it's kind of grown and changed as I've grown up. Well, yeah, I feel that you know. If it, <laughs> I feel that's very I feel that's very suffocating for indigo children particularly because there are lots of rules and routines in place and there are you know there's a lot of esteem issues going on during the teenage years and um, there are a lot of high school kids who have so much potential but they don't know what to do with it or they don't know um, how to focus their energy because it's you know it's either dampened by um, it's either dampened by um, tablets that they're made to take that you know are said to make them better or you know they've turned to they've turned to things to mask themselves from the world like technology and you know, you, it is interesting to note that, you know, you do hear of kids who are highly addicted to their technology and the, um, and substance abuse from younger ages now, and perhaps this has a link with, you know, them trying to find their place in the world. the way they teach addicted maybe teenagers today, it's so stimulated by other things, and have such a broad knowledge. The way I think and half the time. Like um, mm. yeah. Yeah. I know some classrooms mm. will encourage the kids to bring their computers so they look up the Google thing and they, and they yeah. have the discussions that way, but I don't think it happens. It's not taught in a way, I don't think that mm. they encourage it. So I think half the time they realise that the stuff they're learning isn't isn't important yeah. or relevant. No, no. And, yeah. um, so as a teacher, what I've done is I've tried to switch it around because I've been drawing on more of an inquiry based learning model where it's more about developing the skills rather than developing um, it's my little rather than now. developing the knowledge set <laughs> if that makes sense so developing the skills to um, 
to open up neural pathways rather than just um, trying to memorize something yeah. for the sake of it. Yeah, it's a lot of So I'm just going to stop Nathan there because it's 8.30 so I know some people like to go but I'd just like to say because I know that you're all enjoying Nathan's company if you want to stay please feel free to stay behind I know you're open to answering mm -hmm. appealing to anyone so yeah if you could do that that would be great yes, right. <laughs> So we'll just do our little closing down and then I'll leave you to um, chat to Nathan and Thank you to everyone who has contributed to the energy of this circle tonight. Thank you to Nathan for your sharing of your experiences and your wisdom. Please take this energy into your everyday life for the next two weeks and use it for your own healing and for those around you who are in need of love and light.